Are we good? I'm feeling great. Okay, at least we're starting off in a good maybe. spot. You're in. We've done all the all uh, right. Little great. Stuff. Is that a little too loud? Do you think, or how do you feel? All right. Oh, it can be even louder. I love that. I like to be. I like to be loud. Yeah. All right. Well, I am very impressed with all of you, I have to say. And I have been traveling all around the country talking to primarily uh, Tea Parties, 912 groups, property rights groups, people like yourselves who are the stewards of their land and their water. And I'm really impressed that you are so knowledgeable and that you're willing to be active because this is no time to sit back and think that somebody else is going to do it for you. Because we all have to be, it's, as I say, it's all hands on deck. So um, yes, I am a liberal Democrat. And um, I'm also pro-choice, pro-gay marriage. I am a lesbian. Um, what else? I'm uh, a feminist, anti-war. And as I say, the thing that gets them to throw tomatoes at me is I'm a native Californian. That's what <laughs> so, um, I, uh, and uh, of course, as Aaron said, I didn't check my brain at the door. So I do understand what's happening, and partly that is because I am a uh, forensic commercial real estate appraiser. I make my living appraising property for eminent domain purposes, and uh, primarily I work for a government agency. And... <coughs> I'm a researcher, and I also have to be prepared to go to court and testify. So everything I'm going to be talking about tonight is the truth. It's a fact. It's, a, it's supportable. I have plenty of documentation and support for it, and I'm going to be showing that to you, as well as uh, you can also get my book, and I hope that you do get that. And, um, and a lot of it you already know, so that's great, because you can't hear this stuff too many times. Um, the main thing that we want to know is that although I may be a liberal Democrat or whatever, uh, and people say to me, how can you be a Democrat? And I say, well, you know, somebody's got to take back that party. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> that party, the Democratic Party has been hijacked. Yeah, that's right. And so has the Republican. And so has America. And that's what we need to do. That's a big job, but we're going to do it, and we're up to it. So um, you may, you know, as I said, I, I might be a liberal Democrat. You may not be, but the thing is, this is an American issue. It's an issue for all of us as Americans, <clears throat> and we need to work together. All this stuff about, uh, I don't see anything wrong, personally, with pointing fingers at the government. But... Uh, we don't need to do it at each other because it just keeps us separated and we don't want to be separated at this time. It's too late for that. So uh, <clears throat> about 10 years ago, I saw that there was a planning revolution going on in our country. Specifically, I saw it in the San Francisco Bay Area where I'm an appraiser. And I appraise, I don't do houses, I do big commercial properties, big industrial and big agricultural stuff. Um, you know, office buildings, shopping centers, things like that. And I was going into the, uh, to the planning departments of the nine counties of the San Francisco Bay Area, and I was, you know, going in there because I wanted to be able to appraise people's property, to see what they could do with it, to value it, so that they could be fairly compensated by our government when our government was acquiring it by eminent domain. So I went into the counties, and I went into the cities, and I went to see what people could do with their properties, and I found out that there just wasn't much that they could do. There just wasn't much that people were able to do with their properties by right. And that was a big deal to me. That you had to either know somebody or be connected to somebody or pay a permit expediter or go through years of hell in order and pay a lot of money in order to use your property. And I did fight with the planning departments, and I have been thrown out of planning departments. I've been told not to come back. But you know what? We all have to stand up, especially those of us who are in a professional capacity, and say, this is wrong. You are not there as a gatekeeper to stop people from using their property. 
you are there as a servant of the people if you're a government employee. So, <clears throat> you know, I'm here to talk with you about what I call the biggest public relations scam in the history of the world. And it's more than that. It's a takeover. It's a big takeover. It's the agenda for the 21st century. It's sustainable development. It's Agenda 21. United Nations Agenda 21. They call it the agenda for the 21st century, Agenda 21. That's not my word for it. It's not Area 54. It's not Catch-22. It's the agenda for the 21st century. Coming from an international group, it's a global plan implemented locally, and that is its strength and it's also its weakness because we are here locally. We are local. So <clears throat> this plan, it justifies and it enables the breakdown of our economy, and that is what you've seen. This is part of the plan. This is a vital element of United Nations Agenda 21. It's the redesign of your cities and your towns. You're seeing it now. You're going to see it even more. We're in a rural area. You're going to see yourself concentrated into the center of cities and eventually emptied out of any area that's considered to be rural or suburban and into a larger city. This is the plan. It's a loss of our industry, our agriculture, our food independence. Ultimately, it's the loss of our sovereignty as a free nation. This is the plan. This is the goal. So it's social engineering, and it's kind of, you know, at this point, it's uh, the acceptance of what I call the new poverty. It's the uh, kind of the, um, the sense that you're cool if you do without, if you live without, if you're giving it up, if you're reducing, if you're, con if you're constraining yourself, if you're restricting, if you're drawing in, you are part of the new going forward. You notice how the word future doesn't exist anymore? It's just the going forward. Mm -mm. That's what they think. So, you know, it's not what is Agenda 21, it's what isn't Agenda 21. And you're going to look long and hard. This is not Agenda 21 right here. Right here and now. Thank you. I thank you for not being Agenda 21. I thank you. So, <clears throat> you know, I want to talk to you for a minute about Senate Bill 1867 before I get into what I'm talking about because this is United Nations Agenda 21. Senate Bill 1867 just got passed by your Senate. It is the, uh, what do they call it, the National Defense Authorization Act. Isn't that right? Yeah, National Defense Authorization Act. It is the reauthorization. And they just decided that we're enemy combatants <clears throat> here in our country, right here in the homeland, as they call it. Right here, right here in the United States. It designates the world as the battlefield. And it gives the government the right to detain and murder United States citizens right here. Senator Lindsey Graham said that. He didn't use the word murder, but he didn't have to. Without charge or trial, you will be held. And I'm not saying you can be held. I'm sorry to say it. It makes me almost want to cry to say it. But you will be held. And I hope you stand with me. I hope we can really stand together because we will need to. And this is the resistance that we are part of. And I am proud to stand with you. And it does not matter to me. It does not matter to me. Thank you. It doesn't matter to me if you care if I'm gay. I don't care. It doesn't matter to me if you care if Kay and I are married for we've been together 20 years. It doesn't matter to me. This is irrelevant. These are the small things. We are talking about our freedom 
as Americans. And this is the biggest thing we'll ever do in our lives, is defend our country and our Constitution. So, you know, <clears throat> I'm, I'm, I want to talk to you about this because the days of the conspiracy theory are over with Agenda 21, right? You know, at first it was like, Agenda 21, boy, are you a nut. Can I go get some tinfoil for your hat? And I'm like, you know, maybe I ought to buy some stock in that tinfoil company, because there's an awful lot of hats we need to make out there. But uh, the tinfoil hat thing is way over. Now it's not, uh, oh, you're crazy if, it's, if you think it's Agenda 21. It's, oh, that Agenda 21. Oh, that's okay. There's no problem there. You know, don't worry about it. It's not, it's a good thing. That's what you hear. It's, yeah, yeah, it's, oh, we didn't realize you meant that Agenda 21. Yeah, that's good. Well, I'll tell you what. It's not a conspiracy theory. It's a conspiracy fact. And you know it. And the green mask, as I call it, is off. And we're looking at what's behind it. What's behind it is Senate Bill 1867 and things like that, and plenty of stuff like that, like uh, going to a city county meeting, whatever, and you walk in there and they've got armed guards in there. They're wearing a handgun on their hip. And they're standing there like this. And they're looking at you in your own town. So no matter how small your town is, no matter how large your city, no matter how remote you think you are, in fact, the more remote you are, the more in danger you are, United Nations Agenda 21 is impacting you right now. And you know it. So I'm here to help you, and I think that you're already way over needing help, but I will assist you in recognizing what it looks like, and I think you have admirable assistance in that with Aaron and your group. Assisting you and seeing what it looks like because it doesn't come called Agenda 21. They're very careful about that. They meaning your government and the various and sundry non-governmental organizations which partner with your government in public-private partnerships along with the corporations that fund much of this. These groups hide purposely and I know you know that so I'm here to help you take a look at what's behind that green mask because if you can't see it if you can't identify it if you can't recognize it and name it you can't resist it you can't fight it and that's what this is about because awareness is the first step in the resistance so um, there's an overarching political philosophy and I know if you've seen, you know, if you see me do this, I, I have done this before, and it's a good visual, I think, for communitarianism. Because there's a political philosophy, there's a social and political philosophy behind Agenda 21. Because they have to justify what they're doing to us, and they do it by saying that it's all for the common good right? It's all for the common good. You can't just think about yourself. You're a selfish individualist. You can't be thinking about just yourself. How dare you think that water is yours under your land? That's selfish. How dare you think that you should be able to use your property the way that you want to use it? That is selfish. We have to think about what is for the common good. So when you think about that, we have a constitution. It guarantees our unalienable rights, rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That's right, the pursuit of happiness. Who knows what we identify that as being. We've got our life, our liberty, and our pursuit of happiness, and that was given to us by our Creator, right? We are born with that, not granted by an individual or government. But communitarianism, though, that's totally different. Those are the rights of the community. They may not be written down, they may not be identified by anyone in particular, in any particular time, they can be taken at any time, changed at any time, limited or restricted at any time, the rights of the community. The EU, 
The EU operates under the rights of the common good. Communitarian law is law in the, United, in the uh, European Union. And it is beginning to be law in the United States. So when you think about this, you know, you're thinking about the rights of the individual being balanced with the rights of the community. And uh, what does that mean? It, well, you're jumping ahead, honey. <laughs> Go to the head of the class. Um, no, here's the deal. When you look at the way this works, the individual's rights versus the rights of the community. Now, under communitarianism, the individual's rights are like a feather, and the rights of the community are like a brick. They always outweigh the individual's rights. And another thing about communitarianism is that you will be pulled from what you know is right and what you know to be good by a series of crises, crises. So, for instance, you'll be told something is terribly wrong, like maybe the planet is dying or something like that. And, um, and then we pose this, this solution to this terrible problem. That's happening. We got too many lights going in here. It's too warm in here. And we put these things together and pretty soon you're pulled to a place where you're cold and it's dark. Let's say you've got your freedom and that's a box of, that's a, that's a bottle of white paint. And then you've got slavery and that's black. And you're going to pour those two together and you've got gray. And now you're going to be pulled a little bit further because you're going to mix that. That's somehow the new normal, that gray. You're kind of getting used to that. Now we're going to mix that with some more black paint. And you're going to be a little bit darker gray here. And that's the new normal. And pretty soon, when you pour them together, what do you have? You're looking pretty black there, aren't you? It's getting pretty dark. This is how it works. It's slow. It's incremental. And it comes constantly. This is the way it works. It's balance. It's called the third way. Balance is a jargon word and as I said, this is the biggest public relations scam in the history of the world and I'm not just saying that because all of the terms that you will see must have been designed by some real expensive public relations firm because they sure sound good, don't they? Walkable, bikeable, progressive, green, sustainable, visioning, right? All this stuff, it sounds so good. So, you've got a third way. That's what happens. You get pulled and pulled and pulled, and then suddenly you've got the new normal. That is the third way. That is a balance of something you thought you would never give up. Your rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Some tell that gets balanced with slavery and it becomes the new normal. This is the third way. So I'm going to use what I like to do, which is a journalistic framework. Who, what, why, when, where, how, and I forget if there's something else in there. There might be. Anyway, but why is climate change. That's the why. Oh, no, it's not climate change, it's global warming. Global warming, climate change, climate change, global warming. It's, it's, oh, it's something like that, but I'll tell you, it's serious. It's bad. We have, we are destroying the planet. The oceans are rising. The animals are dying. It's bad. Chaos, collapse. It's the end times. It's serious. It's your fault. Here's what a local, our local newspaper said about it. This, one, this actual paper did a nice character assassination uh, little article about me. I'm not going to read it to you. You'll have to find it for yourself. Um, they said, uh, it's hard to deny that the earth is functioning well over capacity. Like an overworked horse, it's simply a matter of time before the global organism collapses. Whoa, that's some heavy stuff. <laughs> UN to the rescue.
We're going to save the planet. Yeah, and the UN's going to show us how. It's the World Commission on the Environment and Development. In 1987, it's the Brutland Commission. Okay, here they go. This is where they really start to maneuver it. They got their sights. They're getting into position here. They're, okay, now you know what the sustainable development is. Everybody's heard of that. You think you know what it is. Whatever it is, it's, it's sustainable development water. Everything we got here, it's sustainable development, right? Okay, here's where it came from. This is the source. Development. It's from the Brutland Commission, UN Commission in 87. It is development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their needs. Gee, that sounds nice. Well, except that we are totally compromising the ability of future generations to meet their needs. And now we have to figure out what we're going to do about that terrible crisis. <laughs> okay. Well, the UN said to that Brutland Commission, we're going to give you five years. You come back in five years with a solution, the action plan. The action plan for sustainable development. And that's what they did, 1992. 20 years almost, 20 years ago, they came up with Agenda 21, the agenda for the 21st century. Every single aspect of our lives is covered by Agenda 21, the agenda for the 21st century. See, and you thought I was making it up. Here it is. Earth Summit, Agenda 21, the United Nations Program of Action from Rio, Rio de Janeiro. Yeah, the uh, Secretary of General, Maurice Strong, he said, middle class lifestyles are unsustainable. That's single family residences where me, I'm guessing most of you live. Private vehicles, appliances, air conditioning, meat eating, that's a threat to the planet. You are a threat to the planet. You individual you. You and your house. If you're sitting on more than about 6,000 square feet of land and you've got a house, you are an endangered species. Somebody better be protecting you. That's right. You're a threat to the planet. Dams, oh boy, that's serious. You don't want to be uh, collecting water. Somebody might use it. <laughs> That'd be really bad. Yeah, they did this thing, they call it the three pillars. <clears throat> They're real serious about their stuff. I'll tell you, they got no sense of humor. I'm kind of losing my sense of humor a little bit. <laughs> it's kind of hard to keep it. I'm trying to hang on there. I know Aaron's doing a good job. But uh, these guys, they never had one to begin with. They're totally serious about this stuff. And you know, that reminds me of something. You know, uh, <clears throat> when Hitler came to power, he didn't have much of a sense of humor, old Adolf. And uh, if you told a joke, if you told a joke about the Fuhrer, you found yourself taken away right quick. No sense of humor. So, gee, I wonder how that ties in. I don't know. Okay, so there's three pillars here. There's economy, ecology and equity, social equity. Those are the three pillars of Agenda 21. And uh, in my book, which you're certainly going to be getting, um, which I like to say is a gift to you, because it costs me about what it, I'm selling it for, and I want you to have it. It's a really good book. <laughs> and the information in it is great. Um, there's a you can't probably see this, but it's three interlocking circles, and this is sort of the visual of Agenda 21, right? It's ecology, economy, and equity, in sort of a Venn diagram, sort of a chunk of the, United, of the Olympic symbol sort of tied together, and where they meet in the center, that's where everything's in balance, and it's all groovy. That's sustainable development sustainable. It's all sustainable when everything's in balance. Social equity. What the heck does that mean? 
Social equity, that means nobody has more than anybody else. That's what that means. You selfish individual, you. Okay, so Agenda 21 covers every single aspect of your life. It's, you see it, it's 300 pages, they got your whole life there in 300 pages and 40 chapters. That's all it took. They are, they're covering economics, housing, transportation, land use, health, education, water, energy, food production, and population control. Yeah, I know, that's the little genie in the bottle. You know, uh, the Chinese, uh, by the way, this is all over the, the, na the world. What am I saying? It's all over the world. The Chinese have an Agenda 21, too. And uh, they're working on a vaccine. A sterilization vaccine. They're working with the United States on that. You Google China Agenda 21 and take a look. So, uh, philosophical basis for this, it's the precautionary principle. You probably heard of it, the precautionary principle. It says that, and this is real important, because think about this for a sec. We're talking about uh, climate change or uh, global warming, or whatever the serious thing that's happening, I don't know what. You're talking about that, and you're saying, it's not true, I got proof here. It doesn't matter, because of the precautionary principle. Yeah. If an action or a policy has a suspected risk of causing harm to the public or the environment, in the absence of scientific consensus, that the action or policy is harmful, the burden of proof that it is not harmful falls on the party taking the action. The burden of proof that it is not harmful, even if there is no scientific consensus. See what I mean? You got scientists, you got, I got 30,000 scientists, well I got 50,000 scientists, no I got 100,000 scientists, no I've got 2 million scientists, doesn't matter, doesn't matter. This is precautionary principle number 15 of Agenda 21, in the absence of scientific consensus. You got to prove a negative. You are guilty until proven innocent under Agenda 21. That's the way it goes. In the EU, this is compulsory. It makes law. In the United States of America, well, they call it the approach, and it doesn't exactly make law, but it makes policy, and it does make law. This is, as I said, a global plan. It is global and it's implemented locally, funded a lot of times by your tax dollars. In 1992 in Rio de Janeiro, it was signed on to by George H.W. Bush, along with 178 other heads of state of other nations. It is soft law, did not have to be ratified and was not by your Senate. You never heard of it. The following year, after Clinton took office, he created the President's Council on Sustainable Development, which was made up of cabinet-level secretaries, about a dozen of them, including education, transportation, energy. Uh, I always forget who was in there. A lot of them, all the important ones. Agriculture, defense. Yeah, this is pretty serious. What did they do? The President's Council on Sustainable Development, besides having government, high government officials on it, also had uh, some captains of industry, mainly the energy people and the chemical people. Ken Lay was on that. This is back before he disappeared. Do you guys really think Ken Lay's dead? I don't. So, no, I don't. I think he's running one. So anyway, <clears throat> I don't think he's dead. But anyway, since we're filming it, there you go, why not? So, uh, <laughs> hi folks. Okay, so the President's Council on Sustainable Development, what did they do? 
They said, hey, and besides, okay, well, let me get to it. Okay, what's the point of having this thing? Because I told you, Agenda 21 is an action plan. Action. Action. What does that mean? It means let's get Agenda 21 into every single nation in the world. Action. It's an action plan. The President's Council on Sustainable Development was created to do exactly that, to bring Agenda 21 into the United States without us knowing about it. The first thing they did was they gave a multi-million dollar grant to the American Planning Association, a private organization, and they said, hey, do us a favor, you guys, for a few million bucks. Come up with a, uh, a plan Come up with a land use blueprint that we can put in every single city, county, and state in the entire United States so that we get Agenda 21 into every single town in the whole U.S. And I said, okay, we'll do that. It took them about six years, and then they came up with Growing Smart Legislative Guidebook with Model Statutes for planning and the management of change. There's another one of those million dollar words for you, change. I said I'm a Democrat, and I am. I did not vote for Obama. But, uh, yeah. Now, uh, I didn't like that whole change thing. It didn't smell right. I think I was right about that. Change. Okay, but this was 93. And by the time they got done with this thing, it was 2002, right around the time that I recognized that there was a planning revolution going on in the nine counties of the Bay Area and by extension in the United States. Growing Smart, a legislative guidebook with model statutes. Model statutes. Model statutes. You think your county is coming up with those laws on their own? You think your city is coming up with those ordinances all by their lonesome? No. They're getting it out of a book called Growing Smart, legislative guidebook with model statutes for planning and the management of change. Who asked them to manage change for us? Change. This look pretty good. All right, change. By 2002, this was in every university. Every university, every college, every planning department in the entire United States. Every single planner who comes out of a school has studied growing smart. Every transportation planner, every urban planner, every planning department's got it on their shelf and on their table, and they're using it. It is the action plan to get Agenda 21 into your planning departments, growing smart is smart growth. Smart growth. What is smart growth? It is the preferred development model for Agenda 21. Ground floor retail, about 12, 12 feet high, built right to the edge of the sidewalk, two to three and above stories of residential. Above that could be apartments or condos. Around the back is your parking for one vehicle, often bankrupt, often vacant, often paid for with your property tax dollars. That's right. Or now your transportation dollars. Okay, so that's what happened about uh, 2002. That was a huge transformation of our property rights at that time. None of us knew about it. Well, that wasn't all. They said, you know what? We're a little bit worried that people might wake up at some point and realize that they're getting messed over big time. So uh, we want to do something to kind of, you know, work them over a little bit. We want to kind of get them on board with us a little bit, but we don't want to get them hip. We just want to plague in them. We want to make them feel okay about losing their rights. So, the President's Council on Sustainable Development did something else. They commissioned a book. It's called Sustainable America, A New Consensus. A New Consensus. Now, of course, consensus, if you've got a dictionary, you know that consensus means agreement of all parties. 
And if you are an old feminist like me, you know what that's like to get into a room with a bunch of women and you work out, you know, you go over some issue and that you're all working on until you come to an agreement. And it might take you a whole night, it might take you days. That's a real consensus. But the new consensus, that's neutralization of the opposition. That's neutralizing your enemies. That's right. That's a Delphi meeting. That's going to a fish and game meeting where you're sitting at tables like a kindergartner and given your little crayons and told to write your little vision down like a good little... You're so good. You're so good. What do you mean you don't like it? What? You don't like it? Did you see that? He doesn't like it. Well, you're, we're going to have to work on you because you, you're really messing up. I mean, don't you understand that this isn't about you as an individual? This is about Bambi being able to get together with Bambo? How could you possibly? That's a Delphi meeting. Consensus, the new consensus, is neutralizing your enemies. And you know what? Communitarianism is using peer pressure using peer pressure to come down on anybody who stands up and says, this is wrong. And you know what you need? You need enough people that they can't pull that on you. That's why we need everybody. Because, you know, it's just too easy, isn't it? It's going to get to the point, and this is getting to the, you know, I sort of use this as my wrap-up, but I'm kind of pissed off about Senate Bill 1867, so I just jumped right ahead. And I want to tell you that I want to live free in my country. That's right. And I don't want any, I'll tell you, I'm tough and strong. And if somebody comes after me, and they have plenty of times now, and tried to shame me and embarrass me for wanting to live free, I will not stand for it. I'm an American, and I won't take that. And I don't want you to either. We will not stand for this. We will not be made to attack you if you don't agree with those facilitators. And this is what the Delphi technique is. It was created by the Rand Corporation in the 1960s, and I'll tell you what, they used it in the 70s and 80s to bring an entire nation to acceptance of the idea of general plans and zoning. This was how they initially used it. Now, what is it? What's Delphi? It is to bring a group of people to a predetermined outcome. A plan that has already been determined in advance. They bring you in. They make you think it's your idea. Oh, you're so good. You came up with that on your own, did ya? They bring you to that point where you think you're so cool. You came up with this. This is our plan. Hey, they didn't give you the option to kick their ass out of there. And I don't know if ass is okay to say, but you know, I'm sorry. If I was with a bunch of Democrats, it would be. <laughs> but you know, um, this is the thing. They bring you to a point where you think that you are just so cool that this is your plan and you agree with it and it's your idea and aren't you great. And this is how they take your rights. And if you object... If you have the guts to object, they use peer pressure on you, they shame you, they embarrass you, they attack you. First they laugh at you. You know, I know you know that thing, but first they laugh at you, then they put your name in the paper with your picture, <laughs> as they've done to me. Say you're shadowy, give you a hard time. Okay, you know, <clears throat> this, is, uh, this is the way they do these things. For anybody who thinks I'm making this up, I did show you Agenda 21, but here it is. You can't see this, but this is real pretty. It's such a cute thing. It's Rescue Mission Planet Earth, a children's edition of Agenda 21. Oh my goodness. It's written by Boutros Boutros Ghali from the UN, Secretary General of the United Nations at the time, and 
the children of the world. Wow, it's got pictures. I'm sure they paid them all their royalties, the children of the world. Um, I, I've got this, okay, it has a little action booklet, a children's activity booklet. Oh, it's so cool. It says, turning Agenda 21 into action is a big challenge for us all. Thousands of people in the United Nations and in governments are working on it. This booklet will show parents and educators how children can start to be a part of this work. Your kids are being indoctrinated. I know you know that. Your children are being used. They're being taught. They're being taught. What are they being taught? That they're a threat to the planet. Yeah, they're a threat to the planet and uh, the individual. The individual is bad. It's all about working in a cohort. It's about nobody left behind. Everybody's equal. We all have to come up together. Nobody should stand out. No opportunity for real excellence or failure. So you have a mediocrity that becomes your middle ground and everyone strives for it because you don't want to stand out. You know, <clears throat> this is how they do it. I told you about, okay, these are the two things, right? You got that. You got your, now they're in the planning department, so you go in there, you get your, uh, get your rights on your property and forget about it. Oh, you're going to get invited to a visioning meeting. Come on down, we got vision reading. We're going to have visions Shasta County. We want to hear what you think about our plan. We want to hear what you think about the fish and game plan. We want to think, it's the game plan, all right. We want to think about, we want to see what you think about it. Meanwhile, we don't give you the option to uh, not like it. It's like, what do you like and what do you think you'd like more? <laughs> I like it and I like it a lot. Those are your options. Yeah. Okay, so they figured it's all about greenhouse gases, right? Yeah, the devil, green, don't, nobody exhale. You're in deep trouble. <laughs> And if you got gas, <laughs> you're in trouble. <laughs> so uh, it's about reducing your greenhouse gases, all right, and fighting sprawl. This is where we are right now is sprawl. I don't care anything north of San Francisco is sprawl. <laughs> so, uh, and you think I'm kidding. I'm not. Really. Sprawl is anything that's outside of a big city. Get National Geographic, by any chance? National Geographic is a spokes picture thing for Agenda 21, as are most of these magazines now. I picked it up recently. I thought we were going to have a, you know, we thought we'd, you know, have a relief. Give ourselves a little break. Get the National Geographic and look at some pictures. Uh-uh. No, they got a new one in there now, a new article on cities, the answer to everything. Cities, the answer to sprawl. You're bad. You're driving your car. You're living on a piece of land. You got an animal. I don't care if it's a cat or dog. They're eating meat. That's not sustainable. So they want to reduce your greenhouse gases and fight sprawl. What does that mean? That means they want you to come into the city so that you can use public transportation on that straight line where it goes exactly where they tell you you can go. You get out of your car because that's too dirty and you're an individual and shouldn't be in a vehicle. What are you hiding in your trunk? What do you got in there? Flown lately? You know what that feels like? You're guilty. You know you're guilty. I feel guilty. I'm not doing anything. I always go for the pat down. In my little way, I stick my toe out of the circle. And I refuse to do the hokey pokey in front of that x-ray machine. They say, oh, you know, that's not a bad thing. I go, I don't care. Just give me the pat down. Pat down over here. Women wants pat down. Pat down. Pat down. Pat down. I'm standing off to the side. Everybody's just, I've been cut out of the herd. The rest of the cattle aren't looking at me anymore. I'm gone. I'm history. I don't exist. You know, 
I always make eye contact with all those people who refuse to look at me because I want them to know, yes, I know what I'm doing. I'm standing here waiting to get patted down by some woman in front of you because I refuse to do what I'm supposed to do in this one little way. Now look, you want to get on a plane, you say, okay, fine, I'm getting on a plane, I can understand, they've got some story going that I'm going to like do something with my shoe or something, I don't know. But, Senator Schumer wants a no ride list for a train. Now, you know what that means, folks? You're going to have to show your ID to get on a train. Well, why not a bus if a train? You don't have a car anymore, so if you want to go anywhere, you better have your ID on you. You walked out of the house without your ID, don't expect to be going anywhere. And what's that in that bag? Santa. <laughs> That's right. That's your country. So. Greenhouse gases, they're cutting your greenhouse gases, whether you want to or not, whether they're bad or not, because we got the uh, precautionary principle says it doesn't matter if it's bad or not, it's we say so and that's the way it is. So, they've got ICLEI, now I know you've heard of this, you're thinking you're a real cool up here, because you don't have ICLEI, International Council of Local Environmental Initiatives, which is an international group that is made up of local elected officials that never tell you that they're part of this international group, that they have signed on to it. Many, many, many counties and cities, 138 cities and counties in California are members of this international group, pay dues to it. It's a group that measures greenhouse gases, and it's like you're on the buzz saw in the conveyor belt on, towards the buzz saw. When you get on there, they measure your gases, they can limit you, restrict you, whatever they want to do, and it's all because legislation has been passed in California, AB 32 and Senate Bill 375. Now that's not just in California for you folks watching. That's all over the United States. They are legislating this, your government is legislating this, so that you are being restricted in your use and your ability to move freely. And federal and state money is being used to build. What's it building? Smart growth. Urban jails that you can leave now. Now you can leave them. How many keys do you need to shut that front door? I heard somebody say, <laughs> when you're paranoid, you only have to be run right once to make it all worthwhile. <laughs> Um, <laughs> I wish I was paranoid, actually. You know, okay, so ICLEI, the International Council on Local Environmental Initiatives, it's, uh, they say they represent about 600 million people in the world. You never heard of them. Now, up here in Shasta County, <clears throat> it's a real communitarian thing, by the way. You know, to tell you that uh, your actions are going to be Makes you feel real powerful though, doesn't it? That your actions are having such a huge impact on the world. Don't you feel really powerful? <laughs> All I have to do is have a little gas and I'm like gonna kill something. You know, it's heavy. <laughs> so, um, okay. So, we got this planning revolution by 2002, Growing Smart was in every university, every county, every city, every state. It's all over, it's everywhere. It's having an impact on whether you can build anything you want to on your property or anything at all. Whether you can use your property, whether it's now a, um, what, biotic view shed, a scenic corridor. Whether you can get a septic tank on your 2,000 acres. I appraised a 1,000 acre ranch not that long ago. I looked at a couple of sales. This guy told me, yeah, we got a thousand acres here. We had to give 400 acres to the uh, county for a, a land trust. And uh, they only let us put one house on it. 
thousand acres. That's pretty serious, huh? So, you know what you got? Here's how it all works. You know, when I was a little kid, I used to say to myself, all I want to know before I die is how it all works. Unfortunately, <laughs> I'm getting to know. The uh, transportation, AB32, greenhouse gas reduction, Senate Bill 375, anti-sprawl, together, for the first time, housing and transportation. You want transportation dollars? You better agree to build smart growth and build it where your metropolitan planning organization says you're supposed to. Now, what is that and who cares? A planning organization, a metropolitan planning organization right here in Shasta County. There's 18 metropolitan planning organizations in the state of California. Right up here in Shasta, you've got the Shasta County Regional Transportation Authority. That is one of the metropolitan planning organizations. It's unusual because it's just one county. Most of them include several counties and often break the counties. This is a way to change your government right under your nose. And isn't this what's real heavy about what's happening? We know how to take up arms against an enemy. But how about when that enemy is part of your country and you do not know quite how to get a hold of it? We are losing. Now you know we're, we are count, we're city, county, state, and fed right? City, county, state, federal. Now we got regions. Regions. You got your regional this, you got your regional that. You got your metropolitan planning organization, which is regional. They are erasing the lines between city, county, state, and fed, and that is the intention, because think about this. Loss of sovereignty. It's like your money that you just lost. You didn't really lose it and it didn't disappear. It went from your pocket to somebody else's. Same thing with your sovereignty. You don't lose it and it just evaporates. It goes to someplace else. It goes to the regions. And this is what we have now. We have regional governance, regional government. So what you have then is a loss of control in your local area. So, uh, you know, I'm just going to show you this. This is, everybody's got a general plan. It's a law. You have to. General plan is sort of the wish list, the expectation, the plan for your either city or county. And you have to adhere to that. Now, here's the one for Marin County. It's a pretty county, real nice. Inside, can you see those three circles? Right in there. Right in there. Agenda 21, right in there in Marin County. Marin County's not the only county that's like that. LA County, lots of counties across the nation. So what do you have? You've got Shasta Forward. Now I don't know how many of you went to the uh, visioning meetings for Shasta Forward. That's somebody's card. <clears throat> All right. Shasta Forward. I don't know if you checked this out. I won't blame you if you didn't, because who can keep up with it? Because this is government by consensus, and the reality is there's no way you can keep up with it. That's the design. They pack those meetings with people who are part of your government, or in an NGO, a non-governmental organization, or some kind of a commercial group, or something, somebody who's going to get some money from somebody, and then you, the real citizens, make up the minority. And when they all raise their hand, or should I do it like this, when they all raise their hand to agree to whatever plans up there on the board or on your coloring pad, you didn't really get any input. And here you go, you've got your Shasta Forward. Shasta Forward, this is smart growth. This is uh, somehow they all end up looking the same. I can pick up any county in the United States and it's going to look pretty much the same. Why? 
because it came out of that box, that box of model statutes, that box that was already designed before you went in the room. Somehow you guys all agreed to have a more urban... <laughs> Here in uh, Shasta County, you agreed that you'd rather live in a big city. Yeah, you did. It's funny. I got it right here. You ought to go down and get it from the county. Go down and pick one up and take a look. Okay, who funded it? Shasta Forward, they tell you, think globally. This is, this is rhetoric right out of the United Nations. Think globally, plan regionally. That's a new one. Act locally. Plan regionally. Regionally. That means you have lost your sovereignty. They ought to put that one on there. Lost your sovereignty? <laughs> right. You got to go get that and go raise some something. Okay, now I'm going to talk to you about something else that's very important. I hope you're not getting bored because I'm not. I came up here from Santa Rosa. I drove, I don't know, what is it, four hours, three, four hours because I wanted to talk to you. Thank you for inviting me. And you know, yeah. I'm glad to be here. I'm very glad, and I, I will go anywhere. In fact, I'm, I'm retiring because this is too important. And even though I love my career and I've enjoyed it quite a bit, it's time to go because this is way too important. I have to do this now. So, uh, as, and you know what? I'm not the best person at it. I do my very best, and that's what I encourage you to do too. You just do your very best. Because every, anybody who's out there talking about this is more than nobody doing it. So as best as you can do it, you do it. So here we go. We got redevelopment. Redevelopment, the unknown government. Now how do they impose all of this stuff on you? They use your own money. Okay, with the regions, with the transportation thing, they use SB 375, which is that Senate bill, that anti-sprawl bill combined with Senate Bill 32. Now, your, uh, your legislators have created this requirement that you conform. And they're tying transportation dollars to agreement and conformance with Agenda 21. They don't call it Agenda 21. They call it Senate Bill 375 and, uh, and Assembly Bill 32. But it's Agenda 21. It's the agenda for the 21st century, which gets you out of the rural and urban areas into the cities. And they'll move you first into the smaller cities. And then at that point, they'll start moving you into the larger cities and consolidating you. Now, this is how it works. They use transportation dollars for this. If your county wants any of that transportation money, or if Reading wants any of those transportation dollars that are going to be available, they're going to have to agree with this Shasta Forward thing. They're going to have to agree to design and build smart growth. And they use your money to subsidize private developers. Now, it doesn't matter if nobody moves into those. Remember I told you smart growth is often empty, often bankrupt? Doesn't matter. They'll hold it for you. They're waiting for you. They're waiting for us. They're building a hardscape for the future or the going forward. So another way they do it is with redevelopment. Now, I know that Reading has agreed to what they call paying the ransom to the state to stay in the redevelopment game. It is not a ransom. People who don't understand redevelopment are being fooled and manipulated and lied to about redevelopment. Redevelopment is the unknown government. It is the vampire that never dies. It steals your property tax dollars. Now you got about 25% of your city is in a redevelopment area. You've got four redevelopment areas. 25% of Reading is in a redevelopment area. 15 square miles, 10,000 acres of your town. Now, what does that mean, including a lot of areas that are producing a lot of property tax? What does it mean? I'm going to tell you what nobody else tells you. I'm going to tell you what it means. Because you know what? Those people who sit in your redevelopment agency, they tell you that it's just too complicated for you to understand, and we're just not going to. You just take our word for it. 
We need it. And I'll tell you what, you don't need it. It's stealing your money. Because the way it works is that, let's just say in 1982, 1982, they declare this area blighted. Now they can declare anything blighted. They hire a consulting firm in that area. That consultant can declare Beverly Hills blighted and does and has. Okay, they declare the area blighted and for the next 30 years, any increase in property tax dollars gets scraped off the top and put into the pocket of the redevelopment agency. Now you think that stays in your town? They put a few street lights up and they make you think that they're spending the money for a good thing, but you know what? 30 years you're paying off whatever it is that they did and it goes to bond brokers and it subsidizes private individuals. Private individuals benefit from your tax dollars. You remember what you were paying for property tax in 1982? 30 years later, here we are, imagine that. For the last 30 years, all of your property tax dollars above that base year 82 have gone to our unelected officials, redevelopment agency, and is mostly paid to bond brokers. Does not go to police and fire, does not go to keep your parks watered, does not go to keep your street lights on, does not go to, to your general fund. It's a redirection of your money, and what does it do? It helps, to, it helps to constrict your town to a point where they are willing to go to any agency that's going to give them money and say, help me, give me some money, I'll do whatever it takes. Whatever. The feds, come on, feds, give me some money. I'm desperate here. The people are going to kill me. We got to get some money in our town. Now you say that looks nice. Yeah, it looks nice. It better look nice for 30 to 45 years because that's how long they're taking your property tax dollars to pay it off. I'm telling you, 25% of your town's money is going for that. Now they have to pay a little money back to the state because the state said, hey, we're starving here. You can't just keep taking this money away from the educational fund. Well, you're thinking, did she get totally off topic? I thought we were talking about Agenda 21. This is Agenda 21. Redevelopment is part of Agenda 21. It is at the heart of Agenda 21 because we're talking money. Where does all this money come from? It comes from you. It comes from your property tax dollars. Part of why we are underfunded, part of why our general funds are starving is because our money has gone to redevelopment. Now we've got that locally and I told you about metropolitan planning organizations and regions, okay? We're in a metropolitan planning organization here, but we're talking about something even worse. We're talking about 11 mega regions in the United States. Now you thought there was 50 states. <laughs> nah. <laughs> hey, I was in Texas. I said, I'm glad you guys haven't uh, seceded from the union because you got guns. <laughs> Stick around. Okay, so there's 11 mega regions in the United States. This is what's happening to us. We are being, we are losing our sovereignty just the way the EU did. Okay, this is what they're doing. They are changing our let our our government so that it conforms more to the regional model. Because then you want to vote somebody out. You've got a regional board that's got 189 people on it, somebody from every elected city and county in that region, that'll, or if it's a mega region, 11 mega regions in the United States, you think you're going to have any power? You already don't feel like you have any power with your senator or your assembly person. You're not even going to know what state to go to to go to those meetings. But they'll still have consensus meetings. Yeah, they'll wear you out with those meetings, but the real meetings, they don't even tell you where those are. You, don't even, you didn't even know that there were 11 mega regions. I know you didn't. I hardly knew. This is what's happening. We have lost our sovereignty already. This is the reality. Now, what they do here, they use high-speed rail. Now, I'm glad you're laughing. 
because this is what they do. They sink you. They take your money and they sink you. This is the reality. This is the plan. This is the goal, is to impoverish us. Remember, one of the three pillars of Agenda 21 is equity, social equity. We've got too much. And we have a long way to fall. And no, honey, it's not just Obama plan. I know it sounds good. And hey, I'm not, I told you I didn't vote for him. But it's not just that. Power has no party. We're talking way past power. Hey, this isn't just some pony race between the blue and the red. This is way beyond that. That's just something, that's just the smoke, that's the bread and circuses. That's the thing that keeps you looking at your nose instead of looking out there at what you're supposed to be looking at, which is that you are being manipulated into another EU, the North American Union, and then a one world government. This is it. You don't have to wonder where it's going. This is where it's going. It's well on the way. It doesn't matter which one of those guys or that woman gets in there. They are all on board with this plan. All of them. All of them. I know he's talking about it. He's right on board with it. Believe me. Livable communities, sustainable cities, one planet communities, community partnerships. If you have any doubts about communitarian law, let me just remind you of the Kelo decision, 2005. The Kelo decision, remember that? The United States Supreme Court decided that the Fifth Amendment of the Constitution that says that you are guaranteed just compensation if you're taken by eminent domain. You're guaranteed just compensation under the Fifth Amendment, but you can only be taken for a public use. Now, I'll tell you, redevelopment is not a public use. That's a private use for a private individual. But what the Supreme Court said in 2005 was, that's okay. We can use eminent domain because we're going to change the definition of public use because it's all for the common good. Yeah, if it makes more money for your city, then it's public use. It's not private use even though it's given your land to you. But it's going to get all of us more property tax dollars. Yeah, that is, the end justifies the means, but you know what? The truth is, the means are the end. That's what's really heavy. The means are the end. This is what we see here. It's the end of private property ownership, and you know what? I just got this out of the paper the other day. Washington, Americans' wealth takes a big loss. Americans' wealth last summer suffered its biggest quarterly loss in more than two years as stocks, pension funds, and home values lost value. At the same time, corporations are amassing record cash stockpiles, $2.1 trillion at the end of September. This is a corporatocracy. This is a takeover of your government by corporations. This is fascism. We are not aware. For some reason, we think it can't happen here. It has happened here. It is happening here. It has happened here. This is what it looks like. A total collapse of our economy a huge increase in unemployment, a sense that we just don't know what's coming. Youth who do not have any hope of a job, who are more willing to accept a handout, who are demanding a handout, people who expect to get money for nothing. This is what happens. The whole fabric of our nation is being destroyed, and it's intentional. This is exactly what it is, public-private partnerships. Now, the ultimate public-private partnership, as far as I'm concerned, besides the low-income housing that you're seeing built all over the place, that low-income housing, 
what do they do? What do they uh, cost them three hundred thousand dollars to build one apartment? Yeah, you think I'm kidding, huh? Three hundred grand when a house is going for one hundred and fifty thousand, sitting there, nobody to take it. But your tax dollars are paying public-private partnerships to build these housing developments. They got granite counters. But I'll tell you my favorite public-private partnership, it's in here. Should I say this is a great book? Let's see. Check out the cover. Is that cool? Um, let's see. Where is that thing? It's um, public-private partnerships. I'm stalling. It's in there. So I can't remember. Anyway, it's prisons. P, 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 P. P. Prisons. Public-private partnership the ultimate in public-private partnerships where your government and a private corporation join together to incarcerate you. And that's a lot of money we're talking about. What do prisons need? Space. Prisoners. They need prisoners. And what do prisoners do? They commit crimes. So you need more things to be crimes. Remember those guys at the meeting with the guns? What are they waiting for you to do? Anything. Go fishing or something, I guess. <laughs> you were fishing. You're going to jail. Hey, you know, uh, deportation? Now, I am in favor of a closed border. Okay, why not? And why shouldn't I be in favor of a closed border? Are you kidding me? I'm in favor of a closed front door, aren't I? You know, I was, uh, I was interviewed by a, a, a lot, libertarians think I'm a libertarian and they always um, tell me that. And, I, and that's cool, I think libertarians are great. Except I said, you know, I want that door to be shut in my house and nobody's coming in there unless I say so. And I feel the same way about that border. Now, I think we need immigration reform. I don't think you should have to wait 12 years to come into the country. That's all set up purposely so that people will come in illegally. So you get this, uh, you get this porous border, little catch and release program. They put them in the privately owned prison for a little six month hotel stay where they get a little on-the-job training about how they're going to come back and do it again and get in better next time and maybe find something else to do while they're at it. That's a lot of money for those prisons. Public-private partnerships. Fascism. That's what that is. And we got it. We got it right here. Right here in our towns. We got, they tell you, the green mask. This is what I call it. The green mask. The environmental mask. The green mask. It's all so cool. Everybody's going to be great. You know, I forgot to tell you this, and I know you know, but I'm going to tell you again. Anyway, that uh, Obama, when he was running for office, you'll like this. When he was running for office, he said, uh, we're going to reduce we, meaning us, not him, I'm sure. And none of those people who are running those meetings are doing any of the stuff they're telling you to do. I'm telling you. Okay? They live in single family houses and drove to the meeting. You, meanwhile, got your donkey out of the... Uh... You can't have a donkey, though, because they... That's right. They got gas. <laughs> so, okay, so there you go. You've, uh, you've got Obama. He's running for office. He's making his change. We can believe it. Okay, he's running for office and he says, we are going to make a commitment as Americans. We're going to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions 80% below 1990 levels by 2050. 2050, first of all, let me just think about that. That's 40 years from now. I don't actually expect to be here to check and see. And neither will most of us. And it doesn't matter, does it? Because precautionary principle, remember? It doesn't matter. These, this is the green mask. They use it. It's just the hammer. You will conserve. You will reduce. So he promised. He said, we're going to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions 80% below 1990 levels by 2050. 
Okay, that sounds really good. Let's figure out how we're going to do that. No, we're not going to do that. We're just going to make the promise. And then we're going to come down hard on you. And we're going to raise your rates up through the ceiling. And don't be thinking you're going to be burning wood. Because that puts too many particulates in the air, you Reading people. You Shasta County wood burning types. Forget about it. You better get used to being cold and riding your bike. Okay, so he said we're going to reduce our greenhouse gases by 80% below 1990 levels by 2050. So I found myself a chart and I looked and I said, all right, where are we if we're reducing our greenhouse gas emissions 80% below 1990 levels? What year is that going to go back to? Where are we going to be at? When did we last have greenhouse gas emissions not 80% below 1990? What year is that? What year is that? What year is that? <laughs> 1934. A stellar year that I'm sure you recall was wonderful. I remember. Remember it well. We had nothing. It was during the Depression. We weren't emitting anything. But you can figure that it's going to be even worse than that because there's more of us now than there were in 1934. So if we're looking at per capita levels, we're going to be worse and higher and it'll be back in the 1880s. Probably. What are they doing to our country? If an enemy took us over and wanted to destroy us, they couldn't do a better job. Taking away, yes, that's right. Taking away our ability to fish, to hunt, to grow. Did you know that growing, that putting a seed in the soil, that breaking, that tilling, that breaking the surface of the soil Reduce, releases greenhouse gas emissions and is unsustainable. <laughs> you think I'm kidding? I am so not kidding. They have this new way of putting a seed in the soil. It's soil seed injection. How much does that cost? A fortune. Removing you from the rural areas and the suburban areas is the goal of United Nations Agenda 21. And one reason for it, besides all of the other stuff, besides the fact that they want to get you into an area where they can manage you, control you, monitor you, and surveil you, is that you're not going to care about your neighbor. You're not going to stand up when you see your neighbor taken away because you're living in a transient area. And if you rat out your neighbor, if you turn your neighbor in, all you have to do is move a block away and nobody will know. It's about destroying you. This is about destroying your humanity. This is the goal. They are taking their page out of the page of a book that has long been written by Stalin, by Lenin, by Mao, and by Hitler, by Pol Pot, by Idi Amin, by Pinochet. I will say one thing for those German people that will be somewhat of an excuse for them, although they do not deserve it. The Holocaust had not occurred when they created the Holocaust. We have no excuse. Look inside yourself now and find that courage. Because you will need it. We will need it. We will need to know. We will need to know who we are. We will find out who we are. We will find out if we are willing to stand up and say no. And we'll know if we're willing to die. I am willing to die. I am willing to die and I mean it. I absolutely mean it. And I hope because and I'm nobody. I am nobody. This is about our humanity. This is about being able to survive as a human being. 
I don't want to live unless I am a human being. And this is what it's all about. We have history behind us to know. We have seen this before in some of our lifetimes. And we know. And we must be vigilant. Communitarianism is very powerful. It sways you with peer pressure. Oh, what's the matter? You're not going to go along to get along? What's the matter? You don't want to be part of the gang? Come on. People would rather suffer physical harm than be rejected by their neighbors. Find your group, and I think you have. When you find your group of people that you can stand with, encourage, this is the important thing. And if there's no one to stand with you, then you be that person for others. Because this is where it's at. Your government is your enemy, and I'm so sorry to say that. I'm so sorry to say that, and I'm afraid to say it too. And that means something to me also, to have fear when I'm saying that. So I want to tell you something about, uh, this is from Growing Smart, a legislative guidebook. I want to tell you this because I want you to know that it's not just me saying your government is, an, is your enemy. I want your government to tell you right here that it's your enemy. Your government has written this down for you and told you right here that you are its enemy. Okay, this is from Growing Smart, a legislative guidebook with model statutes for planning and the management of change. Okay, remember that was put out by the President's Council on Sustainable Development. Now, yeah, it came out of the Clinton years, but it doesn't matter. It does not matter. This is the law of the land now. And what they said in this, well, this is the executive summary. You can get this easily. I've got it on my website. It's Democrats against UN Agenda 21. Don't let that stop you. Okay? <laughs> now, all right, now what they're telling you here, <clears throat> they're talking about building consensus. That's another one of these buzzword things that they do, building consensus. Building consensus, what is that? That's just creating, a, you know, they're, they're like creating more and more people that agree with them. Okay, so what they're saying here is they want to educate targeted audiences, that's you, about the value and benefits of planning and smart growth. Okay, they want to indoctrinate you. They're in the process of indoctrinating you and you're paying for it. And they want to uncover myths used by opponents to misconstrue smart growth. Okay, so that's the other thing. They're indoctrinating you and they're lying to you about what smart growth is and how cool it is and great for you. Okay, equally important, these are, these are their words, equally important is challenging interests, that's you, challenging interests that seek to pass new legislation, expanding the activities that qualify as regulatory takings and therefore require compensation under the Fifth Amendment of the United States Comp uh, Constitution. Now, what does that mean? They're saying that if you know that your rights are being taken, if your rights are being taken, through regulatory takings, and that's by scenic corridors, biotic resources, buffer zones, critical area ordinances, identifications as wetlands, habitats, where you are losing the use of your property and losing the value of your property, the government is telling you that they intend to fight you if you want to try and pass new legislation that protects you and compensates you for the loss of your use of your property. Now I work for a government agency, I told you that, and that government agency acquires property under eminent domain for road purposes. That is for a public use, and I support that. But when you have your government looking at you as an enemy and saying if you want to be compensated for the taking of your rights and your use, 
and we can't afford to pay you. We just don't have the money to pay you. We want to put these corridors all over the United States so that animals can get there, wherever. We want to get those wolves, wolves for crying out loud. You think you're going to be out in the, oh, I think I'll just go take a walk in the woods by myself. See ya later. They're releasing wild carnivore, carnivores into the woods, into the wild. This is happening all over the United States. They're encouraging it. They are getting you out of the rural areas. Okay? If you want to be compensated for loss of use of your property, they will fight you because they can't afford it. They want to take you and not pay. Regulatory takings. The wildlands is the other half of smart growth. Wildlands and smart growth go together. Main thing is getting you into the city, creating the wildlands is what's going to happen to all the rest of the land in the United States and across the world. And they do it by declaring your area a habitat, by saying that you've got, you know, some fish somewhere, by saying there's some bird in a tree, by saying that you've got some salamander under a rock, by saying that you can't put in a septic system on your 45, 60 acres, 800 acres, 2,000 acres, 3,000 acres, half a country, because you might be a half a mile from a stream. There's about 60 million roadless areas, roadless acres, in the United States now, but that's not enough. They're doing this thing in Sonoma County, where I live, where they are deciding now, the uh, Board of Supervisors has just said that of the 1,384 miles of roads in this rural county, they will only be paving 150 miles. 150 miles of rural roads will be paved. The rest will fall into ruin. They're talking about pulverizing them into gravel. Is that going to affect your property value out there? How is that going to go when you don't have a car anyway? How are you going to get out to your property? How much is that worth? Think you're going to lose that pretty soon? You growing something out there? It better be a pretty high value crop. I don't know what they're going to do if they decide to make that stuff illegal again, because isn't that the only thing that's supporting most of these counties? Where are they getting that money? What are they getting it from, uh, welfare or something? Oh, I don't know. Where does that money come from? Yeah, I see it. It cycles. It recycles. It's just the same amount of money recycling all the time. It's getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Poverty. This is how it happens. They create the new poverty. This is the goal. The more people on the dole, the more they'll be willing to do whatever it takes to get that money. The less people who own private property, the less people who care if you lose your private property rights. If I'm living in an apartment in Reading, I am not going to care. I'm going to think you're a big pig if you're out there on your three or five or six or ten acres. What, am I going to feel sorry for you, Santa? Forget about it. That's right. All right, this is the deal. They're using the cover of environmentalism to impose the rigid control of a totalitarian state. That is what's behind the green mask. It's an abuse of trust. And all of us have been abused in our lives, and we all know that it's not what your abuser says, it's what they do that matters. And we see what they do. They may tell us that we want to hear your opinion. Come on down to that visioning meeting. We want to know what you think. No. What happens, what the reality is, what it looks like, is the real thing. And the real thing is the imposition of a totalitarian state. The FBI is doing domestic surveillance right now. 
The ACLU is fighting that. Make your allies where you can. You don't have to agree on everything. You find the things you agree on and agree and make common cause because that will make you stronger. You're agreeing with a Democrat right now. <laughs> it's good. It feels good, doesn't it? <laughs> okay, so I want to tell you this. I was in Dallas giving a speech not too long ago. And I like to do this wherever I go. People think uh, Agenda 21 is not in the paper. It isn't out there. It is. It's in every single paper, every single day. You just got to know what to look at. In fact, it's real hard not to see it once you see it. Well, here it is in the Dallas, front page of the Dallas newspaper. They're talking about bullying. I forget what the top of this thing was. Schools helping kids thwart bullies. Who wasn't bullied? Raise your hand. Right. Okay, now I'm not saying it's, hey, you know, I told you I'm gay. It's a good thing to be able to go out there. I, first of all, I'm saying I'm gay. I'm not worried I'm going to get stoned in the parking lot. That's an advance. We've, <laughs> we've come a long way on that one. But, uh, you know, okay, do we have to make a federal case out of it? And here we go. I guess we do. Here's Julie Herzog, director of, and get this. Hi, Julie. Uh, the National Bullying Prevention Center. I bet they pay her about 150 grand a year. What do you say? Uh, she said national change in bullying will come with a federal law. Whoa! How many six-year-olds are they going to have in those jails? <laughs> what did you say? It's off to prison with you, young man. <laughs> That's, they're not joking around. Oh, you got a kid who sent a little naked picture of themselves to some other little kid? Ah, ah, ah! They're going to jail. Oh, no, no, I forgot. They're not going to jail. They're going to get identified as a sexual predator for the rest of their lives. That's pretty good. You tell them that on the first date, or uh, do you wait? You know, this, this is criminalizing the population of the United States. Now, the Germans did it. Tell me they're not using the Germans as uh, their model. Well, they, you know, actually, you don't even need to wonder. You just go to 1984. That's a good one. I mean, the Germans, Stalin. Hey, I got news for these people who are all on board with this stuff, who are smart growth advocates, who are the ones who are bringing you in. They're the facilitators. They're so cool. They're up there with a little name tag. They think they're so great. Not that, I mean, name tags are cool. Forget it, you guys. But I, I'm talking about the one. <laughs> No, no, <laughs> those other ones. No. <laughs> you know, <laughs> no, I'm talking about the ones who are running those meetings, right? And they think they're really cool. They're going to be the first ones to go after me. Yeah, because uh, that's what they do, the revolutionaries. They take, o they take over and they take out their supporters because they're dangerous. Of course, they're going to take out most everybody. Okay, so the uh, Alto Tower, oh, this is one other thing I've got to show you. You've probably seen this before, but uh, I just love this. This is so cool. This is the tiniest spy plane in the world. It is so cool. The tiniest spy plane in the world. Doesn't it look like a hummingbird? It's smaller than this, this little picture you see. It's smaller than this. I've seen a video, uh, YouTube of it. It's this little tiny thing. It looks like a hummingbird. <laughs> Eight miles range, an eight mile range, audio, full audio and video. Fly in and out of windows and doorways. It's, it looks just like a bird. It's a surveillance device. And I'm reading this, it's in the New York Times or LA Times or something, and I'm reading it. I'm thinking, oh, cool, you know, they're going to be using it to, uh, you know, like supposedly find Obama, something like that. You know, they're, got, they're looking, whatever. Oh, it's going in the caves in Afghanistan. Then I get down to the bottom of this thing, and it says, it's not likely to be a hummingbird. This is only the prototype. Because a uh, hummingbird is a rare bird in New York City. They're going to use these things for domestic surveillance if they're not already. Domestic surveillance. This is what's happening in our country. All totalitarian states. Uh, excuse me, but uh, can you tell them I'm busy? <laughs> All totalitarian states share the same
five or so elements. Okay, all of them do. I always get this wrong. Maybe I'm just not cut out to be a totalitarian. Um, they share total control. First of all, they got total control, right? Con of production, of unions, of uh, education, of food. They all they have total control. Total information. Full surveillance. They know everything. They know where you are. They know how much money you have. They know everything you're doing. They know you're here tonight. Um, that includes, you know, loss of free speech, because of course you're not going to be talking much when you know you're being listened to. They also share the philosophy of everything for the common good. It's all for the fatherland. It's all for the homeland. The homeland. Aren't you? I hope you never use that word. All right. It's all for the common good. Individual is selfish. It's all for the common good. This is part of the totalitarian framework. They also share an adherence to a Spartan ideal. We are tough. We are pared down. Decadence is foul to us. We use less. We ride our bikes through the snow. <laughs> Obesity is going to be a crime. I'm not kidding. You probably lose your kid if your kid's obese pretty soon. They also share something else. Two other things. They share the vision of the glorious future. High-speed rail. Yeah. Fresno to Bakersfield, here I come. <laughs> High-speed rail is designed to waste your money. That's right. Now, your glorious future. High-speed rail, everybody living in multi-story buildings, drinking coffee in the ground floor coffee shop, and watching everybody. Glorious future. Sky's always going to be blue. It's never going to snow. It's never going to rain. It's always beautiful. You're going to be eating your vegetables and smiling. What else do they have in common? Terror. The war on terror is a war on you. It's a war on you. Revolution is bad for business. And this is a corporatocracy. This is a corporatocracy, fascism. The ownership of government by huge mega corporations. This is now. Communism, fascism, Nazism. This is it. This is what it looks like. What it looks like is this. We don't realize it. We think it can't happen here while it is happening here. So, who's doing it to you? Consultants, your government, nonprofits. There's big money in green. The bicycle coalitions are out there pounding the ground for sprawl, anti sprawl, for smart growth for complete streets. Complete streets mean you paint a bike lane down the road and you demolish both sides of the streets and build smart growth on either side. You think I'm kidding? Walmart is a partner. Unions, AFL-CIO in 2001 at their convention, they said they denounced sprawl. We denounce sprawl and we call on all unions to support smart growth. Why? because most union members are in urban areas. That's right. Churches. If you've got a pastor talking about sustainable development, you better go have a chat with your pastor. 
because they're going to be using your volunteerism against you because you'll be volunteering for nonprofit groups that support Agenda 21 and you won't even know. That's pretty. The schools and the universities you know, the churches uh, were treated to a little message by a uh, Yale uh, University woman who's got her, uh, she's a woman's name is uh, Mary Evelyn Tucker. She's with uh, Forestry and Religion in Yale, at Yale University. She said, uh, churches need to adapt to the ecological model or disappear. Yeah. Okay, cops, community-oriented policing. This is funded by the Department of Justice. It's probably right here in Reading. There's probably an office. Community-oriented policing, they say they do gang monitoring, but they're designed to do surveillance of local people. What the heck is it with those guys being uh, armed in your meetings? What are they doing in there? You want to ask them, why are you here? Why are you here? Are you here to threaten me? Are you here so that I will not speak up? Or are you just taking a donut break? <laughs> I dare you. <laughs> you know, this is a whole life plan, right? It's a whole life plan. It impacts every aspect of your life. It's brilliant. Hey, man, these guys are smart. They have hired the best and the brightest. They've got people writing scenarios that are in Hollywood. They have designed this very well. And I see that most of us in this room are my age or older. Where are the young people? They have been indoctrinated through outcome-based education. They have been trained like dogs. We need, listen, we need, that's right, we're also being drugged. We are being drugged. I smoked marijuana, I didn't inhale. <laughs> or exhale. <coughs> oh, that's your problem. But, um, you know, it takes your energy away, it takes your focus away, it just stops you from caring. What a perfect drug for a takeover of a people. It's perfect. Prozac, Zoloft, Wellbutrin. Oh, these are the select drugs of a takeover. They don't want you speedy. Fluoride. <gasps> Fluoride, whatever. I don't know about that, honey, but I'll tell you what. You're taking these drugs because you can't handle it. Nobody can handle it. Life is tough. It's heavy out here. And we're all going to have to wake up and get sharp. So we're going to be having our voices silenced. I am speaking out while I can until I can't anymore. Join me. Hey. Oh, wow.